And we're live. It's the Mind State Marketing Hour. We're grooving. It's cold and we're grooving. The five biggest challenges consultants face and how to solve them with behavioral psychology. Starring Will Leach. He's the author of the book with a new look. Marketing to Mind States. How are you, brother? Doing well today, Steve. We, uh, I think we're just talking before the show. We have some snow here in Dallas, Texas. It's a, uh, it's a good and a bad day for Dallas. The good news is that all the kids are out of school. The boy is happy. He's out playing hockey. The bad news is that every four by four out there is out there thinking they can run in the snow and do whatever they want. And that's never mm -hmm. a good thing. Dallas, we have no idea how to drive in snow or ice, my friend, but it's a good day. It's fun, man. How you doing? I'm excellent. Yeah, those guys with the four wheel finally they get to use it. You know, they bought this four wheel drive. It's off road. You know, they what's the stat say you might use it like one percent of the time. Today's the day yep. they give it the gas. But what they don't realize is the stopping power on those is nil. They will not know until it is too late. I remember a couple of years ago, I was driving in a snowstorm here in Dallas, leaving, coming back from the airport, and. Uh, I can remember seeing this big old four by four. He was just cooking. Everyone else was going like 10 miles an hour. And he was on the side and he was just going, going and going. And all of a sudden you just could see, you could just see him. He started shaking his front wheels, started shaking. And he slammed across two lanes of highway and boom, right behind me. And so like, it was just, it wasn't a horrible accident, but it was enough to block the entire basically two lane highway at that point. I got home. I don't know what time other people made it out of there, but it was ours. Cause this guy just thought, Hey, I can, I can do, I got the four, I got the four wheel drive. So God love them. God love everybody there. But uh, we don't do well in snow, but it's fun to watch. It's right out here. It looks great. All right. It's Mind State Marketing Hour. So this whole thing started because we'll recognize that people approach decisions, buying decisions in particular. Well, we approach every decision in certain yeah. states of mind. But in your case, how can we improve our marketing message? If we knew that people were in certain states of mind, then we would figure out what that state of mind needs and bring it to them. And that's what it does. Will's book breaks the paradigm that you have one size fits all messaging for everybody. It's not true. We're all unique. We all approach things different. There's and Will's book shows you how to do it. Will, so um, when you started to see that you had a little something here that people needed, did you waver? Did you think, no, who am I to kind of realize this? Or did you like, yeah, I'm the guy. I, I was born for this. Yeah, I, I think it was a little more the latter, not because I have some kind of a, you know, uh, a high opinion of myself. What I realized is that I didn't come from academia where you could spend 10 years, 20 years of your career focusing on one social science. Like there are people who focus their entire career on maybe pricing. I didn't have that. I got to read whatever I wanted to. I got to find patterns in data. I got to talk to many different professors from all over the world, in fact. Um, and it was through those conversations over the course of honestly a decade was then all of a sudden I saw this pattern, this thing that kept coming up again and again. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm lucky enough to have seen the pattern because I wasn't pigeonholed into one social science. And so that's what makes what I do very different than what other people do. So um, it was that day when I realized that pattern and kind of wrote it down um, was a big day for me, but it always evolves. It, it always evolves. You know, it's always going to get better. Whatever we're talking about today, 30, 40, 50 years from now, there'll be other new theories out there, things like that. So I know we're in an evolution for sure, but uh, I caught on to this myself. I feel pretty good about it. Excellent. Patterns. You know, when people talk about artificial intelligence, what they're mostly talking about is the power of um, programming to go out and study and recognize su successful patterns in a body of data and come back and deliver those insights or or manipulate whatever the task is to mimic that or to reflect that. And ultimately, I think experts do a similar version. You were talking about you recognize a pattern in a disconnected universe and notice that it was consistent across multiple domains and you started to apply it here. And right. I think that's excellent. Thank you. I try to tell anybody who asks me, you know, how do you start a business or whatever? The first thing I tell them is find your one thing 
And that one thing is you got to find that pattern. I, and I don't know how to teach people how to do it. I was blessed to find it myself. It was through passion. It was through interest. It was through books that I read and books that I chose not to read. But it's an important part of any, when you even, you know, we're talking about it today a little bit, I guess, if you're going to start a consulting business is to find that one thing. And that was my one thing. Um, and so it came through intuition, a lot, a lot of reading and hard work. I think starting to recognize patterns. I played football in high school. And so when you first go play football, you get up there and you're on defense or offense and they say, hut, and what do you do? You just close your eyes and run into the pile, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. That's a novice. So when you start off in, a, in your profession or whatever, you kind of do the same thing. But over time, when the, when the play is starts, you start to look for indications and then you are able to go into the play with a plan. You're able to apply a strategy. And that's the same thing happens in a profession that over time, when you see you're recognizing patterns, you're actually, the play has slowed down a little bit. You're not so caught up in the one little task. You're able to back up and look at a bigger picture. That's where, that's where professionalism yeah, and I, I would even say, you know, you and I, we've talked about this, about this idea that marketing should be, you should be playing the long game. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason why is not um, anything more than if you play the long game and you think about marketing and you keep trying new things, you're going to find patterns over the long run as become better and better that you'll get down to the tactical level, knowing that this works for your audience and this does not work for your audience. So sometimes, and I, I've fallen victim to this as well, where you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm marketing. Why aren't I getting sales? It's because you're not in the game long enough. But if you think of it as the long game, you'll pick up on patterns, whether you know it or not, it'll be intuitive to you and you'll become a better marketer. So it, it works in life. All right. So the five biggest challenges consultants face, how to solve them with behavioral psychology. Where does this come from? Where does this topic coming from? Yeah, I just saw the new jobs report um, that came out. Well, actually the new jobs report that came out earlier on this week, but actually before then I was reading an article the week before that was talking about the numbers of people who have started their own business since the pandemic hit globally. Why? A lot of people got laid off. A lot of people realized that from when they're working from home, they have a freed up three, four hours. They can do a side gig. There's a lot of reasons why People are taking their expertise and becoming consultants. And I started thinking about all the consultants out there that either lost their job or they're just starting out there. And they're thinking, man, I wish there were like, like, I wish there were some things I knew or I could learn from maybe, you know, me in this case uh, that could help them navigate this first year is going to be a really tough year because you're just trying to figure out what is a consultant do? What, is, what am I trying to do? Things like that. So I started thinking about the consultant life. I was there when you guys were there a decade ago. If you can believe it, Steve, I started about a decade ago and uh, figured I'd just talk a little bit about some of the challenges and some ways I've navigate those challenges even to this day. You and I started about the same time. I know. I love that story, man. We're both you know, in the shower crying <laughs> around the same time, trying to figure out why are people buying? I got to make a mortgage payment, but here we are a decade later. Go team. I want to quit. No, mm -hmm. you can't quit. Send her an email. All right. Focusing on what not to be. Not to be. Right. So I got this bit of advice when I first started with my company. So here's, here's, here's what it was. I was at PepsiCo. I had this new idea, this new model. It wasn't, you know, the same model I teach in the book, but it's pretty, it was an early iteration of the model. So I had something pretty new. And I knew a gentleman. Um, he's a Harvard professor named uh, Gerald Zaltman, really famous in the marketing research field. He created... Um, uh, metaphor elicitation techniques. It's really, if you're in research, you probably know this guy. And he kind of wrote a book. He had a model and he wrote and he created a successful consultancy. And I used to buy, I used to buy from him at PepsiCo. So I called him up and I asked him just for his advice. He gave me a couple of minutes of his time, really generous. Cause I don't think he really knew me very well at all. Um, but he said, will be sure to focus on what you don't want to be. So focusing on what not to be, that's even more critical when you first start your business than understanding like, where do I want to go with my business, et cetera. Because what happens is you're going to find, especially in the early stages of your, of your consultancy guys, is that opportunities are going to come your way. Some of your old friends are going to know that you're in consulting and they're going to throw bones at you. They're going to throw, Hey, I got an idea for you. You're going to see a lot of companies coming out to you and wanting to do joint ventures. I, I went through my three years of joint ventures and because people see what you're doing and they think, yeah, I can, we should be working together for all the right reasons, by the way. And those can become incredibly big distractions. And the way to not get caught up in all that is really being clear, not just of where you want to take your company, 
but what things will you not do? So you got to be to do that. I think you got to be really clear on your goals from a business perspective, but also I think your lifestyle goals and what you want. So I'll give you a classic example. I'm still 10, 10 years in, right? And this past week, I got an email from um, head of insights um, at PepsiCo uh, in, in one of the divisions in financial planning, I think. And he proposed, he said, hey, great email. Seems like an incredible guy and said, hey, we are staffed right now to, or we are not staffed to take on these three major projects in pricing. And when I was at PepsiCo, all I ever wanted to do was price size architecture, which basically figuring out the sizes of bags and the prices of bags based upon the non-conscious. I, that, that to me, if they were to let me do that, I'd still be there today, no doubt. Cause like, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to use behavioral science to figure out how to size up things and price them. I'm a dork. So this guy literally said, we're doing that project and we heard about you. And, um, but he hears his parameters. He said, Will, we already chose the firms that are going to do the work for us. So I'm not included. Cool. That's fine. But then he said, so what we're really looking for is somebody who can step in for 30 hours a week to kind of act as an employee, join our team. You know, you're going to, you can work from home, but we need you to be that internal consultant to summarize all the stuff. This is a classic example of a great opportunity where we can make a couple thousand dollars, I'm sure, but it would take me away from what I want to do with my business, even though it's a passion of mine, I would love to take on that project. So by understanding that my job is not just to grow my company, my job is to eliminate things that could cause me not to grow, like spending 30 hours a week working on a really cool project with a large company and talking myself into that. So that's an example of knowing what not to be. So I was like, I don't want to spend 30 hours of my week working for another client working internally for a client. There's no business growth there. It's a neat project. There's no business growth for me. And I love working from home. I love wearing, you know, clothes that I want to wear. I love not being in the corporate environment anymore. So that, so I would tell you, you know, be very, be very deliberate in writing out the things that you won't do. And most people do it like this, Steve, I'm sure you, you've got your list. There are certain industries you won't work with just because you don't think it's probably right. Like there are industries, like I'm not going to go work for a drug cartel right? I'm not going to do that. I mean, there's a couple of industries that I'm just like, you know what? I'm not so sure about that, that I want to lend my expertise to that. Like a cigarette company is probably not going to learn from me how to do subconscious marketing. So there are certain industries. That's the easiest thing you can do. But what I want you to do is focus on things that you won't do. Like what I just said, I'm not going to be an internal consultant to a large company if it takes away from my, my ability to grow. So do that. And, and the way to do that, and, and you and I talked about this, Steve, last week, and I want to bring this up again, because I just, I'm still fascinated by this discussion of this passion journey or this, these currents, right? And I, if you guys didn't listen to the podcast last week, um, you should go check it out because we talk about this. But the advice that I was given by somebody who's very successful and they're kind of in the latter parts of their career is he said, looking back, I wish I would have stayed within my passion current, meaning don't be so focused on just this one goal, scale my business and sell, scale my business and sell, stay within a passion or in a current of things that you love. And if you stay within that, and knowing when not to leave, just like PepsiCo, I would have gotten out of my passion current. If I were to go work inside of PepsiCo, even if though I make a little bit more money, I'd stay, I'd be out of my passion current of what I get to do. Like right here, I get to do the show. I get to teach all these things I love to do. That's why you have to know what not to be. There's a book called uh, Primal Branding by Patrick Hanlon. Hmm. He, he calls it the seven pieces of social code seven pieces of primal branding but one of the things in there is when you know who you are you know who you don't want to be and ev every brand he, you know, his premise is a brand is a belief system and so for people to buy into a belief system you have to be real clear who the non-believers are so that people can pick their identity you know oh that's part of my identity I don't isn't want that it. so hard to do right mm -hmm. as a business owner it's scary when you to make that decision right well when you talk about in the beginning of your journey you kind of don't know mm -hmm. you're needing to do the reps you need to wax on wax off but over time you go i don't like that aspect of the wax on i'm at comfortable enough to where i say i don't do the wax on i just do the wax off you know mm -hmm but you have to go do the rep. So at some point you're going to start to land on real clear why you don't want to do that or don't want to be that. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you know what I'll tell you guys, if you're out there listening and you're, you're just starting your consultancy, 
there is a moment, uh, Steve, you probably have one too, that one day, and it happened to me probably year four, so it took a while, it took a lot mm-hmm. of reps, that I said, I'm not going to do that because that's my wax off and I don't want to do wax off. Yeah. And it was an example of me going to a place I just didn't want to go, even though it was an opportunity with a really large company. I remember feeling confident in my business, confident in myself to say, no, no. I'm going to choose not to do that. I'm not going to do it. And it's a big, guys, it is a big moment in your business. The day when you could say no to somebody, the second biggest day is when you can fire a client. That's a huge mm-hmm. day. When you when you feel confident enough to say, I don't want to work with you anymore because we're just not, we're not seeing eye to eye. That's a great day. But that first time I said no, because I was so confident knowing who I was and who I wasn't going to be, it's a big day in your career, guys. Take advantage of it. The day for me was when I, I thought, you know, I don't ever want to work with a customer. I have to convince on why this is a good thing. A I only want to work with customers who want, who are asking, how are we going to make this work in my situation? It's a two different, two different things. Mm-hmm. I struggled with that. I still do this day because we're in the behavioral science space, right? So it's a lot of why still. But mm-hmm. the first three years of my business was every conversation was trying to, to trying to fight the why. Here's why you should do it. People don't want to be sold on why. Um, things are fine, whatever. I can be better, whatever. Uh, that's a great place. That's a great comment because I still focus on a lot of why because people just don't know um, a lot about what I do. But boy, that's a great one. I love it, Steve. It's a good one. Well, let's find you more people who already are convinced. Yeah. Breaking through the noise. Yeah. The like next big challenge, man. It's yeah. a big one, guys. It's, you know, uh, there are so many consultants, right? And if you're in the consulting space, whether you, you're a coach or a business consultant or a weight and fitness consultant, whatever, advertising consultant, whatever, there's just so many. And so I always talk about um, this idea of ultimately what you want to do is be able to differentiate yourself away from being an expert. Um, and I know that sounds really weird. Like, wait, wait, I'm an expert at whatever. But remember, I ran these numbers not too long ago. If you say, hey, I'm a marketing expert, and you type that into Google, you're going to get 1.6 billion hits of people saying they're marketing experts. Okay, it's so okay, great. I know I have to I have to be much more specific. So let's say I'm a behavioral marketing expert. That's pretty, it's pretty focused, right? Right now, there's 55 million hits of somebody or people saying they're behavioral marketing experts. So then I say, okay, let's get even more specific. And I type in mind state marketing expert. And guys, there are only three experts in the world and two of them are on this show right now in the entire world. And right now, Google says there's 583,000 hits. Now, I did not put out 583 pieces of content, guys. Why? People out there say they're experts at stuff. We all say we're experts at things. We all say that we are um, that we all have our case studies. We all have our logos. That is not the way to differentiate yourself anymore. That is not. Being what we call iconic is. I believe that's one of the only ways you can break through the clutter is being iconic. Now you have to define what iconic means for you. For me, I always talk about being iconic is this idea that you are worthy of attention and praise, meaning that people will come to you. Um, They will want you to speak at their conferences. Media will come to you. Um, You can charge more if you're iconic because you're the, you're what's known as the industry icon, right? Um, You're resilient to competition. There's a lot of great benefits of trying to create an iconic brand. Harley Davidson is an iconic brand. Apple's an iconic brand. There's lots of different iconic brands, even at the lowest level. There are iconic brands in my neighborhood. The burrito place down the road is an iconic brand in our neighborhood, right? Uh, Burrito Brothers. So, but what I will tell you is that you have to understand how, what makes you iconic. And what really is, it's, do you have a distinct point of view and do you have a compelling purpose, Right. So we always talk about the compelling purpose is why did you get out and do what you want to do? For me, I saw marketing was broken. I was in corporate America for, for, for 20 years almost, and we were spending tons of money and not getting very good results. I mean, tons of money, multi-millions of dollars every year. So we're not getting good results. And I also saw that the way to, to get better results is behavioral science. Those are my two passions. I married those up and I created an iconic brand around mind state marketing. If you are going to become iconic and break through the noise, you've got to do the diligence. You've got to do the reps. You've got to do the work to figure out what makes you iconic and then start promoting that thing, whatever that thing. For me, it's Mind State Marketing. I did it through a book. We have a podcast, websites, all those types of things, social media. You can do the same thing for you if you're a consultant, but you got to figure that out because if you're just saying you're an expert in um, HR processes, I'm telling you, it is a crowded field. There is no field out there that is not crowded right now. 
every field is crowded and they're all saying they're experts. So you, you do have to have a point of view. You have to have a, maybe even it could be a little bit controversial point of probably view. Should be. But it probably should be. But where does that come from? It comes from, now imagine that you walk into a room and there's, we've just had this explosion of, I'm a business coach. Now, everybody's a business coach. I'm an expert business coach. All right. That's a, but when you, but when you say, I believe if you're not running really clear systems and processes, then your business is struggling. Well, our minds immediately go, oh, he, he must have been around the block a little bit for him to have the conviction to make that statement because I'm going to push back a little bit. You need to be able to defend it. But you're not going to have the confidence to defend it until you've had some some reps, some time in the business, some bumps. <clears throat> That's how you differentiate yourself by defining what you believe and then having a clear statement. Yeah, I, and I, I think that is what differentiates kind of people that are really good at what they do and can help you versus those people that are not very good and what they can't do. Like, have you seen the amount of life coaches now who are coming out like 23 years old and 24 and I'm getting emails all the time from these life coaches, life coaches, like my kid's almost as old as you. I mean, come on. So there are certain things that help me when you push back and it's not to say that younger people don't have incredible things they can offer. In fact, they, they can, but they better be specific because it's, it's like, well, let me have how to organize your life around technology and the new kind of world of systems integrations. It's like, okay, now that person can have some incredible iconic, you know, brand around that, but you won't know that until you get to that level of specificity. You know, you got to have that level of specificity. I like what you said, Steve, right? It's the, um, to be a little bit controversial because if we're all teaching the same thing, then nobody's differentiated. So you better have a contrary point of view. Hopefully that contrary point of view works, but it's, it's to be contrary is what's going to make you pop and stand out. Absolutely. Activating on your client's key mind state. Yep. I'm telling you guys, you know, if you're taking nothing from these sessions, you should take this away, right? That understanding your customer's non-conscious is the most important thing you can do. Why? 95% of all decisions are made at the non-conscious level and you're making roughly 35,000 decisions every single day. So you must understand how people make decisions at the non-conscious level. It's a must. You're never going to be optimized. You're never going to be able to grow to your fullest potential and grow that brand to become iconic if you don't understand four simple factors. We talk about that in the book, uh, Marketing to Mind States. What I want you to do, though, is at a minimum, is think to yourself, before you start doing a ton of marketing, think to yourself, what are the aspirational goals of my customer? You've got to get yourself empathetic with your customer and understand what their goals for life as well as their business. And that's one thing that I, I think that's, it's a struggle for most people, if you, especially if you're doing B2B consulting. I do a lot of B2B consulting. And you're always focused on, well, what kind of service can I offer to make this brand grow? Or what kind of service can I offer to you know, get share for this brand? And you think in the abstract, realizing you you must realize that the person that is hiring you is a human being and they have wants and needs and desires that they have for their life, not just their brand, but their for their life. So you have to take those things into consideration. Then identify their mind state. We're not going to go into that today, but there is activities in the book that will tell you how to uncover these psychological mind states that are everything in understanding why people do what they do and how to message to them. For me, uh, my customers are, I believe, in, in mostly in the optimistic empowerment mind state. What are yours, Steve? Yeah, they're in the uh, cautious achievement. Cautious mindset. achievement mind state. Now, why is, yeah. tell the audience why you believe that your customers are in the cautious achievement mind state? Well, you know, my heroes are entrepreneurs. And what is an entrepreneur? They like, they put it on the line. They risk everything, their future, their clients, I mean, their, their family's future. So what does that mean? This person's going to power through. It may be messy, might have a scratched shin or something, but I'm going to come out on the other side. That's achievement mind state. But you know what they like to do? They like to avoid stepping in a ditch, wasting time, wasting money, wasting uh, uh, time with someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. And they're going to be attracted to someone who's going like, I understand you're a winner. You're going to get there regardless, but I might have a little map, map and a flashlight and help you get through that dark forest a little bit faster. Yep. So I love that. So that's the cautious side. So cautious achievement. Mine, guys, optimistic empowerment. I believe that my customers, there's a lot of marketing researchers, brand managers, 
We have uh, creative directors. Also, entrepreneurs want greater control over their business. The world's complex. They're being they're in meetings all day long. They have things being thrown up all day long, and all they want is more control. That's the empowerment motivation. And I, what I do is I think that my customers specifically are focusing on wanting more control because they're getting more thrown at them. So they're thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, how can I just get more control, more control? That's called the optimistic empowerment mind state. If you don't know what those terms mean, what Steve just said, or I don't, what I just said, you got to pick up the book, guys. It matters. You will understand your customer at a totally different level if you understand that they are seeking more of you know this motivation, but they approach that uh, th- those behaviors in either a cautious or an optimistic way, it's going to matter. And so the thing I would tell you then is identify your mind state. You can read about these in the profile in the book. You can go to the, the website, mindstategroup.com. You can learn more about these things. But then, right? So we're just still talking about almost like research, but the really thing you got to do is, well, you got to activate on the mind state, which means you got to go through the, 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 the discipline of looking at your touch points your website, your emails, your social media, your one-to-one interactions through that lens of that mind state and look at it basically very in a disciplined way. We do these things through behavioral audits, but look at it through through this disciplined way and say, am I, am I messaging in a way that would activate on that person's mind state, whether it's your customer service, whether it's your sales, whatever that touch point is, do that work. It's not that it's hard. It just takes some time and discipline. And, and if you're not, what's going to happen is, you don't realize it, but your copywriter is writing to their own mind state, not to your customer's mind state. They're writing to their own mind state. Why? Because we've never learned this stuff. And you are talking to your customers when you're trying to do a sales call in a totally different mind state. Why? Because you don't know their mind state. And so that customer is getting confused because they have a feeling deep down of how they want to feel, but you're speaking to them in a way that you feel. So you got to do the work to say, I'm going to focus on everything I do is on their mind state. And I know it sounds simple and like, oh, we, of course we do it. The vast majority of time, Steve, we don't do it. Even I don't do that. I don't do it myself. And I know this stuff. So you got to get in the habit of looking at all your touch points and being consistent. I actually, just this morning, uh, I'll do a shout out to you guys. Um, I was looking at uh, my total, my entire website and noticing the consistency. And we built these pages over a year and a half, honestly, some pages weren't there when we first worked together, but it's so consistent now. I'm like, I'm so proud. I wrote a note. It's like, I wrote a note to Sam. It's like, man, I'm so proud of our website. Why? Because we took the time and the discipline and it feels consistent, not on what I want to say to customers, but what customers want to hear from me. Totally different thing. But here's the thing. It's when you're able to present information in a way that makes them feel understood, then they feel safe. Mm -hmm. People do business with people they trust. People, they get this power from being understood. And that's what creating your content in a mind state, understanding the mind state does actually. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so let's do one more here. So selling, this is really a big one. Selling your services when you hate selling. Why do you say this? Man, when I first started my company, I did not realize that people just don't buy your stuff because you, you, you sound smart. You actually have to, you have to, you have to convince a certain extent, like why uh, they need you. So I, I will tell you this: there's fear and there's self-loathing <laughs> for people who feel like they have to sell. I saw this study um, about a year ago, and I, I'll get this a little bit wrong, but basically, salespeople think less of themselves on the average than politicians do. <laughs> like n- salespeople are constantly, you know, being seen as all manipulative, sleazy, slimy, things like that. So of course, when you become a consultant and you're like, oh, I don't want to be, a, I'm not one of those sales guys, right? But a challenge is you have to sell your services. You have to be able to get on the phone eventually because if you're going to do any real consulting, it's going to be more than just your marketing guys. Somebody's going to want to talk to you. When they talk to you, you got to get yourself into a frame of mind that you are not a salesperson. So I got a couple of things I want you to think about. One is, I don't think, and this took me a while. I no longer think of myself as selling anything. I'm not, I don't sell you anything. My job is to serve my clients. That's what my job is to do. And many times my job when I'm serving my clients is to tell them they don't need me. And it's weird to think that, but it's a very easy conversation when I hear about, when I hear what they need and I go, 
That's not me. I, that's, a, that's a totally different thing. So I'm not selling you anything. I'm here to serve you. The best way I've heard this mentioned, and this helped me a lot, is when you're talking to somebody, imagine you're a doctor. Take a doctor frame. Have you ever heard these doctor frame, uh, the doctor frame, Steve? Yeah. Yes. So the idea is what you do is just like a doctor, when a patient comes into the doctor, they ask questions. They try to diagnose a problem. They're not selling anything. They're not selling penicillin. They're trying to diagnose a problem. So imagine you're a doctor. You're going to talk to your client. The client's going to tell you some things. Here's what's going right with my business. Here's what's going wrong with my business. Here's what I'm not doing right. Or you're going to help draw those questions out. That's what great consultants do. I think you do uh, these questions, right, Steve, to really draw that out. Mm -hmm. So a question, a, a good doctor diagnoses the problem based upon feedback that they're getting from their patient. You're going to do the same thing. And all you do is you provide a treatment plan that meets that, that the, the, those symptoms. You provide the treatment plan. Now, a lot of times that treatment plan is not going to be something you're great at. If somebody has a, foot, a problem with their foot and they're talking to um, you know, a, a general practitioner, maybe they need to go see a specialist. If you're the general practitioner, you owe it to your client to tell them that and say, you know what? I think you probably need a specialist. You need an online specialist. And when you act like that, if you take over the doctor mentality, you are no longer ser um, selling anything. You are serving people. People will appreciate that. They know it's in your heart. If you're coming from a good place of trying to help that person out, and I promise you guys, you're going to feel more confident on the phone when you can say, I don't really have a treatment plan for you. Um, but also you're going to feel like you're never selling anything. You're going to better that person's company. So be confident in could be confident in your services, but your job is to not sell anything. Your job is to serve and take on that doctor frame. Don't commit malpractice. I like that. Yeah, that's right. Don't <laughs> commit malpractice. And you guys, it's easy to do, especially in your early stages, right, Steve? You're like, man, I can kind of do that work. I think I can do it. Let's fake it till we make it. That is not fair to your clients who really have a, a business need or, or, a, or a personal need. If you're a weight loss coach and somebody comes in and says they have a problem with bulimia, that is probably not your area of expertise. Could you help? Maybe you owe it to that person to go find the specialist or at least tell them that you're not the right person. And that person will remember you forever. Best, best call I ever had was, I still use this company this day, was a vendor who came in and asked me, Hey, Will, tell me about all the projects you do. This is back when I was way before Pepsi. And I listed all the projects that we do. And I'm like, here it goes. Here's what we do. Here's what we can help you here. We can help you here. He did the exact opposite, Steve. He said, he, he went to the board and he started crossing things off. We're not good here. We're not good here. We're not good here. And he left like two out of nine. He goes, we're pretty good here, but this is what we're really good at. I'll never forget that feeling of trust because he told me five out or maybe seven out of the nine things that I listed, don't think of me. He pushed away business. I never forgot that feeling of trust. That dude 20 years later is still somebody that we go to regularly for projects. That's because he was a doctor. He wasn't selling me anything. He was just telling, he was diagnosing my problem and telling me, here's the treatment plan where I'm specialist at. Excellent. Excellent conversation today, yeah. Will. I enjoyed this. Me I'm too. Gonna... We got a little music coming what? here. We... What's, what's that, Steve? What it's is it? The, it's the transition. <laughs> I'm the producer here. We're doing a transition. Oh, all right. I thought, I thought somebody's keying in on us. Somebody's trying to tap in into our show. No, so we're breaking through the noise, activating on your clients, key mind state, selling services when you hate selling. That's right, focusing on what not to be the five biggest challenges consultants face. Now, for our favorite time, we got music. Now we're going to watch Will dance. We got three questions coming at you, Will. All right. Let's see if you can dance, brother. What are the largest factors influencing shoppers? That is a broad question, but an easy one because I teach this in my class. The largest factors that are influencing shoppers come down to three things. It's social factors, which are basically who you're with when you're shopping. That influences many, many different purchases you make. Secondly is the environment where you make these purchases. So that is kind of the look, the feel, the environment around you. And the third one is what we call personal, but that is gonna be your psychology in the moment of a decision, your mind state as well as um, we will say loyalties in there. I'm not a huge fan of loyalty anymore. I don't believe it really exists that much, but technically loyalty to products, things like that, those, those are in there too. So the three combinations are the three factors are personal factors, social factors, and environmental factors. Look at him, you got moves. Got him. Next question here. 
how do people make purchase decisions? Uh, well, dude. Okay, so this is way too complex. I wrote a whole book about this and it's not even scratching the surface probably. But how people make purchase decisions, think of it this way. There is a need of some kind that moves into the place of somebody's considering what they can you know, do to reach that need. And then lastly, there is a decision to buy or not buy. So think of it as need, consideration, and choice. Now remember, all these things are happening at a conscious and subconscious level. We talk, we know these are system one and system two. That's important for you to know about. So you have to identify those conscious things that influence consideration and those non-conscious things that influence consideration. Same thing with choice. For consideration, there's something called mental availability, which basically how quickly you come to mind when somebody has a need, what are they considering? Like what are the possible solutions? That is called mental availability. If you win that war, you become one of the top five brands or solutions. After that, you got to focus on choice, which is how do you influence somebody's mind state? That's in my book, but really it's about a mind state. It's about directing the behavior, creating emotional fuel to act, lowering resistance, and then creating a shortcut. Long, long way of doing it, but basically it comes down to three things. Somebody has a need, they consider products and solutions, and they choose something. If you know all three of those little, if you can diagnose those three things, you understand how people make purchase decisions. Whew, that was a Ooh. tough one. Hey, you got this. You're, you're this intellectual guy. That was a hard one. Okay, so now this, this question, obviously Robert, Robert Caldini, he's jealous of your book, but can you talk about Robert Caldini's work and how that applies to mind state marketing? Yeah. Uh, okay. So guess, that guy is not. I guess they're talking not about embarrassed or, or you know, uh, he, 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 I learned so much from this guy. So he, he is definitely not a fan of my book. I'm a fan of his book, Robert Caldini. He's a professor at Arizona State University. And back, I think in like 2005, maybe 2006, somewhere in that time period, he wrote a book called Influence, and ah, I got Influence right here. It's like a seminal book if you're into behavioral understanding. It's a massive book. The guy, the guy became world famous, and he talks about six different, um, what he calls heuristics, right? But there's these six different things that influence people's decisions. Reciprocity, commitment effect, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. Oh, and reciprocity, there's your sixth one. So he talks about those in this book. Those six concepts are in my model, but I expand it off of what he does because what he talks about a lot of times assumes that people have a motivation. So he's talking about triggers to a decision or a behavior. So he has these six different cognitive heuristics. My book expanded those six to 21 and I include motivations and I lower, fr uh, um, lower friction. So my stuff builds on his book, though um, his book is, I mean, it's one of the top books you should be reading if you've ever um, read or you want to learn more about it. It's called Influence. I just expanded on it on the last part of my model, the cognitive heuristics side of my model. Yeah, a lot of your stuff, I think, uh, impacts the liking persuasion uh, principle that he talks about in there because you like people you relate to. You like people you trust. And when you dial in your marketing mind state, that's what you're pinging. You're pinging one of those important persuasion principles. Yep. All right. We got the music in the background. It's been a great show, Will. So um, what's on the what's on tap for this weekend with the fam? Um, it's a snow day like here in Dallas. So I'm sure we're going to be doing a little bit of snow action. Well, it's probably melted, honestly, if I'm being honest with you. So, But uh, it's going to be a typical day uh, weekend in Dallas. Lots of little events here and there. We're probably going to go to the comic book store with the boy. It's comic book time. So probably gonna pick up a few comic books and uh no that's about it what are you doing you know i'm i guess i'm gonna go out and do snow angels um <laughs> yeah i haven't done that in a while so uh, um, you got plenty of it over there all right kids what a great show so we um remember get will's book will you've got a little uh before we go you've got a little um breakthrough sessions going on is that right we do guys this is for people who they've listened to the show they've watched our things you know our videos on youtube and they're like you know i know there's something to it but i just want to understand how do i apply behavioral sciences to grow my brand or my business or my skills 
So we have these things called breakthrough sessions. If you go to mindstategroup.com at all over that site, you're gonna see these little red boxes called schedule a breakthrough session. In those sessions, you're gonna work with me for 45 minutes and we're gonna talk through your business and I'm gonna diagnose just like a doctor, take on that doctor frame. And I'm gonna tell you some things that maybe you haven't thought of in, uh, in helping you to maximize the growth potential of your brand or your business. So you schedule one of these 45 minute appointments with me, you get to speak with me live. We're gonna talk about your business and see you know, how behavioral science can be used to help your business grow. Good job, Will, good yeah. job. All right, everybody, so here we go. Remember, we've got podcasts. If you like to listen, it's on all the places where you find great podcasts, you'll find the Mind State Hour there. And subscribe on youtube channel the mind state channel on youtube you can watch see see our similar heads bobbing around talking about geeky stuff about marketing will good job brother thank you much i appreciate you now that was a good conversation hopefully hopefully made an impact on a on an up-and-coming consultant we got some likes out there so good, good job all right that's a wrap <laughs>